Now, we are joined now by public affairs analyst Femi Lawson, who is here to talk to us about the headlines that uh, made headlines across the world this week, starting out with the lockdown uh, being eased in Lagos tomorrow. Well, welcome, Femi. I'm so happy to see you again. Speak to my namesake once more. Good morning to you. <laughs> so if we begin with the lockdown, we are expecting the first phase of these uh, restrictions to be eased on Monday, the 4th of May. That is, of course, tomorrow. How are you expecting Lagosians here to respond to that? Is it going to be an opening of the floodgates, or will this be more of a phasing of, a, of us going back to normal? Well, uh, Nigerians, particularly those in this part of the country, they also go and those in Abuja are so much anxious of returning to work, are so much, uh, so much anxious of you know here. what Can't tomorrow hear. will offer. But uh, we must, as a people, generally be careful as much as we are anxious to resume normal life that has ceased for you know, some couple of weeks. We understand that, just like the minister said the other time, that we are fighting an invisible enemy. And the stage that the pandemic has gotten into in the country now calls for serious caution. So I understand, of course, that there may be so much, you know, rushes across the cities, you know, as you must naturally anticipate, especially with Lagos. But I think it is important that a lot of caution be put into place, not only by government, but most importantly by the citizens, because we have a fundamental role to play in ensuring that we limit as much as possible the spread of COVID-19. Yes, uh, well, oh, go ahead and go see. Yes, um, well, we're, we're still going to try to, uh, you know, hear what um, Mr. Femi Lawson is saying uh, in the course uh, of the show. But uh, I, what are your concerns, uh, really, as um, this lockdown is about to be lifted officially uh, from tonight? Uh, Lagosians, uh, people in Ogun State and the FCT will be able to move around, albeit a bit limited. But what exactly are your concerns as this, um, you know, uh, stay at home is being lifted? Well, f some fundamental concerns, as far as I'm concerned, is, no, rather, what have we been able to achieve for the period of the stay at home? As especially when it comes to our capacity, you know, to fight this invisible war. Have we been able to use this number of weeks before releasing the people you know, back into the streets tomorrow to develop on our capacity to test for the virus, to expand you know, our healthcare facilities as expected? What, see, these are the fundamental issues that we must begin to think about as you know, people are released to eat their, the street for their various businesses and work from tomorrow, particularly in Lagos, and Abuja, because uh, we, it should not just be a five weeks, you know, wasted sitting at home for the people and for the government. It must be a moment that we have been able to achieve, you know, you know fundamental steps that can actually limit the spread of coronavirus. But I don't think much more have been done except for, you know, a state like Lagos that has often taken, you know, the lead even before the federal government took the decision to shut down you know, some of these uh, cities. So the concerns are, have we been able to develop capacities to track you know, people who may begin to contact some, this virus more than we have had? If you remember, between the time this lockdown you know, on these cities were placed and today, we have had an increment of nearly 2,000 number of you know, cases of people that have been infected by this virus. So we must begin, we now begin to ask ourselves if at about less than 100 when we lock down the cities and within the lockdown we have been able to record over 2,000 cases, then what are we doing differently by the time the people return to work tomorrow to ensure that these cases do not, do not go out of hand? So these are the issues that are of serious concern and I think as citizens we must not over rely on what we are expecting from the government in terms of their capacity because the truth is that the government in Nigeria today is very limited when you talk about healthcare delivery. And that is why I keep emphasizing that the citizens must take this destiny into their own hands by ensuring that we maintain as much as possible social distances, then you know, listen and obey the direct, you know, health authority directives. And these are the ways we can practically you know, slow down 
the spread of the coronavirus because I don't think much more has been achieved in the last five weeks in terms of tracking, in terms of improving our testing capacities, in terms of improving on you know, available facilities to take care of you know, people who have contracted this virus. If we were to compare Nigeria to Ghana, I know that at, for at least a week there were lots of criticism yeah. to, uh, towards Nigeria in terms of testing. We hadn't tested uh, uh, more people and countries like Ghana, which were comparatively uh, a lot smaller than Nigeria, mm -hmm. had been able to make such huge leaps in terms of testing. And because of that, Ghana felt it was a good enough time for them to lift their restrictions. We've seen that almost blow back in their faces because there's been a jump in confirmed cases, more than a thousand since Ghana has done that. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee the same happening in Lagos if we were to go ahead with uh, the plans on Monday to ease these restrictions? It may be inevitable because the stage at which the virus is spreading now in Ghana, for instance, and in Nigeria. You know, it has graduated from you know contact from people who have travel histories, who had primary contact with people who have travel histories to community levels. Now, in Ogun State alone, there are seven local governments where you know these incidences of coronavirus have been reported. And what that tells us is that it is now at community level, the community transmission mm -hmm. of this virus, and that is why. We cannot, you know, say that we should not expect what Ghana has experienced in the last couple of days. But the other angle to it is what capacity, just like Nigeria, does an average African country have to keep the citizens at home, you know, for societies where there are no, you know, basic amenities that can keep citizens at home, for societies where there are no, you know, social security that can ensure that people can, you know, conveniently sit back you know, and enjoy their life as expected, even if at a minimal level. You know, just like what has been the cry on the streets of Lagos, oh, people are hungry, we cannot eat any longer. And these are the realities on the street because for, we can continue to lock down the cities. But it has proven that what we experienced in the last five weeks does not automatically mean that a total lockdown will, you know, will reduce the number of cases, but I think what we need to do and what governments must do now is to improve on the testing capacities, expand the healthcare infrastructures and begin to work on you know, the development of vaccines and, every, and drugs just like every other serious countries are doing in order to squarely tackle this pandemic. Because mm -hmm. if the stage we are now, it has gone beyond, you know, a lot of cities in the United States have been locked down for the last couple of weeks, that has not reduced the trend, you know, of this thing because there will be contacts, whether you like it or not. And for societies like our own, like Ghana, where government can hardly, you know, take care of the welfare of the citizens, you would expect that government have to ease restrictions, just like the government of Nigeria have done. But the citizens have a lot of role to play in ensuring mm. that we don't take okay. advantage of this, you know, ease of restriction, you know to encourage a further spread of the disease. Um, well, uh, there's so many other issues we need to look at this morning. Uh, of course, almost every thing still has to do with the COVID-19 and the issue of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. The uh, DG of the NCDC has said he has expressed worries that we might record, we will actually record more cases if uh, the lockdown is lifted and normalcy uh, may not return to uh, Nigeria. Uh, until around 2021. But let's uh, talk about what the Northern Elders Forum are saying. They're saying that politicians, uh, governors, mm. are politicizing COVID-19 as a way to siphon uh, funds. Uh, how does this come to you? Well, I, I want to quite agree with the Northern Elders Forum, especially when you look at the body language of some of our politicians, particularly those governors who think you know, every issue has to be politicized. It is very unfortunate that at a point in time, you know, we were reading how the Akwaibom state government was asking for a rerun of the test conducted on some people within the states that, you know, that resulted into, you know, the initial cases recorded in the state. Akwaibom, and over the time, we have seen all sort of controversies arising from, you know, the conduct of some of these governors on 
the journey so far as far as the but in what the, way really uh, would you say that uh, they're actually politicizing or even trying to siphon take or advantage get funds of from this. government take for instance there are states in the, of course it is expected that there should be cooperation you know there should be synergy between the federal government and the states on an issue like this but what we have experienced over the last couple of you know weeks that this pandemic had moved by some of these government, not all, anyway, you know, to turn this to a fundraising effort individually while not you know, investing in the same manner. Into the, we have seen states who have op that have opened accounts, you know, requesting for donations, but have not been, even been able to put, you know, 50 bed spaces of isolation you know, centers together or in place for, to address this pandemic. And you see a particular government requesting for a particular amount of money from government, from the federal government. Where, have you, what assessment have you done? How did you arrive at this figure? What has been, you know, this, the, the, the roadmap drawn by the state, you know, to fight this, to tackle this pandemic? None. Only, you know, to just wake up and begin to make... Femi Lawson, let's put you on hold as you give us more of your thoughts when we return uh, from this short break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. We are still joined by public affairs analyst Femi Lawson, and he's here discussing headline issues. Now, before the break, we were talking about the lockdown and how it would affect people as it begin, begin to be eased tomorrow. But I'd like to switch gears slightly, still on the topic of COVID-19, but if we focus now on River State and the fact that it's complained that it hasn't received enough support from the federal government, what are your thoughts on that issue there? This agitation by the River State Governor didn't start today, but I think uh, some of these governors should take a cue from the approach that the Lagos State Government took, of course, which, of course, even before the state became the epicenter of the COVID-19, you understand that even if before the first you know, COBO released by the federal government to support the Lagos State Government effort, the state had on its own you know, moved ahead you know, in you know, establishing an isolation center, you know, taking care of the first set of people that had contacts, and you know, the index case, in the case of the Italian and other people who had contact, and the first line of people that contacted, you know, contracted the coronavirus in Nigeria. It's unfortunate that a state that has not put any visible infrastructure on the ground, that has not, that is not seen, you know, yet to be taking any fundamental step to address this pandemic is busy agitating from day one for support from for fund from federal i think that was a that was quite a misplaced priority it would have been better and it would have been more reasonable so to put it if governors have taken a cue from the step taken by the Lagos state government in ensuring only a few days ago, you know, and you will see the effort of the private sector, its collaboration with the Lagos state government, yielding a lot of re results over the past couple of days. There's a large, you know, of course, a large community of the private sector in rivers also. How much more has the government been able to engage, you know, the private sector in river state to take steps just like Lagos state government have taken, instead of waiting for fund, 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 and this demand for money from the federal government. It is quite necessary that federal government gives support, like it has given to Lagos, to some other state that may have had you know, recorded cases of coronavirus. But of course, Rivers is not even on the first three or even four of, of such states that requires an emergency funding from the federal government. Look at Gombe State. Look at what is Kano, happening in Kano State today. Look at Abuja. How, much, how many billions has the federal government been able to give to these states? That River State is demanding, and the government is agitating that but federal government should, you know, I think it's quite misplaced, and it should have you know, shown the world what he has been able to, you know, invest and put in place to tackle this pandemic first before making you know this consistent demand for money from the federal government yeah you do make a, a strong point there but so what mr wiki is arguing is that lagos is a commercial uh, nerve center of nigeria while uh, river states and other oil producing uh, states are the ones who actually provide uh, the uh, revenue that nigeria lives on and so what he's saying is like you have uh, labs in lagos 
you know, uh, provided by the, the federal government in Kano and a few other places that Rivers uh, deserves uh, similar uh, treatment. But let's uh, even move on to, uh, it was uh, Labor Day on uh, May Day, May 1st. Uh, the president assured workers that they will not be sacked. No workers will be sacked without uh, due process. And of course, the NLC has expressed a lot of uh, worry about uh, the impact of a prolonged uh, lockdown and the fact that it is possible that a lot of workers will lose uh, their jobs. This uh, reassurance is coming from the president that workers would not be sacked without due process. Uh, wh what are your thoughts? Well, uh, the, the consequences of uh, what coronavirus has brought you know, upon our country is a global reality. In a lot of countries of the world today, people are losing their jobs in millions. It is only expected that, you know, government must look at you know, the life after the COVID-19 pandemic and look at how we can improve not only on government capacity to employ people, but on government capacity to create more environment that will enable you know, the private sector to improve on its capacity to engage more of our citizens. The truth remains that government does not have the capacity even to sustain the present workforce. So rather than looking at, you know, you know, giving the assurance alone, like the president has given, which is a welcome development. I think government should also take steps further by ensuring that the space is widened for private sector participation and, you know, by, that we're able to create more jobs. And these are the ways we can give assurances to our citizens and, you know, the labor, the, the labor union, the labor, uh, the workforce in the country. And on the, on the part of the labor leadership, uh, of course, the labor unions have reasons to be, to be afraid, considering the global reality. But the truth is that the union must do more and must work more to be seen, not only on May days, but on every other issues that have to do with the, the existence of the workers. We are talking about job court here. Are we talking even about you know, the wages that those that are even still kept in the job are earning? A lot of our workers today are earning wages below you know, what you can call a living wage. No, not even The average Nigerian worker does not even earn a, a living wage, what we call minimum wage here. So the labor center must engage itself on issues that even affect the welfare of the workers that are presently engaged beyond you know, the mid-day you know, agitations or demands of getting workers retaining their job or not. But, but people have always made uh, such uh, agitations, including uh, this latest one where uh, it was reported that the Kaduna state government plans to cut about 25% of uh, workers' salaries you know, to help in the fight against the COVID. And the NLC, the workers are saying, Mr. Governor, you can do no such thing. Or yes. you should not do any such thing. Yes, because, because the governor does not have, I don't think he has a singular authority or power to do that. It must go through, you know, the legislative process that actually gave birth, you know, to the remunerations being taken, not only by workers, even the political office holders. So it's because we are not, we are not under a dictatorship where, you know, a governor can just wake up tomorrow and begin to issue orders like a decree. I think the labor union must engage the governor. If there are, of course, needs for that decision, it must be a collective agreement, not just you know, an action taken like the action of a sole administrator. It would not work. But the labor union must consistently engage the government in order to ensure that issues like this does not even arise in the first place. Labor unions should not be seen on October 1st and May 1st during celebrations alone. They must consistently work on the welfare of the workers. They must continue, continuously engage you know, employers of labor, the government, the private sector. And this is the only way that the labor unions can be taken seriously, even by some of these people who are in authority, because today we find employers of labor taking decisions without consulting with the labor center, just because you know, they have seen an ineffective you know, labor center that is operating. So I think the labor union must improve on what is presently doing and must continuously engage you know, government and other employers of labor.
how you think that they can improve? I know you've mentioned a few things that they can do in terms of making sure that they use their powers to call upon their governor, who can then turn to the central government. But we speak so much about not using foreign solutions to Nigerian problems. But I think we can break that down a bit more and say that we can't always apply central government solutions to state-specific problems. So on this matter of the of the National Labour Congress or Labour issues, what needs to be done state by state to make sure the people within said state are well taken care of? There, there, must always, there, must, there is always an harmonization, you know, of, between the, you know, of the workforce, irrespective of which category uh, of, uh, the, of the sector of the economy they are working, be it the state, the federal, and that is the only way you can have you know, an, an effective you know, labor center. So the, uh, the labor union should not you know, limit their focus you know, on agreements or conditions that are achieved by the decision of the central government alone, but must continuously does the same way it has continued to engage the federal government on issues of minimum wage, you know, welfare of people, poor workers in the public sector. It must use the same energy to engage some of these state governors who in most cases do not even know no agreements you know, that are reached at the center. We all saw what happened during the 18,000 naira minimum wage and the, you know, the, the journey towards the 30,000 naira minimum wage, what we call minimum wage anyway, that's a poverty wage. So we must ensure that it is not only when there are issues of wages that the labor center begins to engage the state government, you know, and other employers of labor. It must be a consistent effort. It must be a continuous move that the workers themselves and Nigerians should see or must see, must see happening. Okay. Well, uh, the move by the Kaduna State Governor Erufai actually has to do with senior civil servants who earn uh, 67,000 naira and above. Uh, those are the people that uh, their salaries. Uh, he's hoping or planning to deduct about 25 percent. But let's let's leave them. that matter. Yes. yes. Now let's bring it to uh, both even the public sector and the private sector, where it is expected that many people are going to lose it's their jobs. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like I said, it's a global reality. Yes. But uh, of course, there must be a human faith to whatever direction this has to take, especially in the private sector. We've heard recently, you know, major. The corporations laying off their, you know, workforce just because of the outcome of the global pandemic. And I think, like I said, there must be human face. People shouldn't just wake up and, you know, get meals of being disengaged without even, no matter how minimal, proper remunerations being given to cushion the, you know, the immediate effect of what some of these actions, you know, with, and government must not leave the private sector, you know, to, in a blank, Blanket manner, you know, cut, you know, just down, you know, down, throw out people from from their jobs. So it should not be a blanket thing. The government must supervise and make sure that it monitors, you know, how the, because the overall implication of uh, unemployment is on the society. And for whatever we affect the larger society, government at all level must be interested. But the truth is that there will be job cuts. There will be. A lot of people will lose their job, but as soon as we are able to recover from this, like I said, we should not begin to look at what opportunities are available around the government circle, but how much more government would, what, how much more energy government will put into engaging the private sector and expanding the capacities of the private sector in order to create more jobs and employ more people. And I know a lot of people will have to be reintegrated. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Femi, it's, it's almost perfect timing because we're going to take a very short break. When we come back, we will still be talking to public affairs analyst Femi Lawson, and we will continue discussing headlines uh, across the world and Nigeria this week. Please do stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. We are still joined by public affairs analyst Femi Lawson. Thank you for staying with us, Femi. I wanted to switch gears once again and now talk about insecurity in Nigeria, specifically President Buhari's uh, warning uh, on the removal of what... I'm sorry, remo his warning. Let me find my words because I'm so excited. <laughs> his warning in regards to uh, Boko Haram and the, the threat they pose to Nigeria. Could you tell us more about that? Well, well Boko Haram has remained a threat. Even in the face of you know, the invisible war that the country is fighting, even in the face of 
the lockdowns. There have been series of attacks you know, on communities in the Northeast. And I must use this very opportunity to give kudos to the Nigerian military for the work they have been able to do over the last couple of weeks because uh, there's a renewed you know, determination, judging by you know, the reports from that part of the country, on the part of the Nigerian military, to tackle this menace that has almost become you know, part of us. And uh, you know, the president, the charge by the president is in line, but beyond the charges and beyond these uh, directives and uh, you know, warnings, as you may want to call it, the government must look at how much more we can improve on the capacity of our military men, we can improve on the equipment. You know, one of the things that gives morale to people on the front line, you know, you know, is the manner of equipment that they have to, to, to prosecute this battle. The insurgents are so, of course, like we all know, are so equipped in a way that marvels even people in the military. And it requires more than presidential, presidential directives, you know, and cautions and warnings for us to defeat the, the, the Boko Haram. What would, it, what would it take to defeat Boko Haram? Because uh, in, in his statement, the president said uh, he did warn uh, the military against uh, complacency. And is there a sense that uh, the military may be complacent at this time, especially uh, the, you know, considering the fact that Nigeria is facing so many wars on different fronts? No. Both uh, the health sector, the economy is in crisis now, and you know, there's a search for how to uh, pr you know, pull Nigeria back uh, from the brink. Is there some level of complacency in the military now? Well, I, I would not want to totally agree with the president on that, especially when you look at the sacrifices. No, he warned them against uh, complacency. Uh, uh, yes, not of course. They, they are complacent. There, there might have been some senses of that or some report about that. But the truth is that there are, there's tendency for you know, soldiers to be complacent, especially when they are short, they are shortage of equipment, when they don't have you know, the welfare it's not taken care of as expected. You know, it is when people's, you know, interests are taken care of, when people's welfare are taken care of, when they have enough equipment to prosecute this war, you should expect, and if you look at the, the, the history of, our, of the Nigerian military, especially when you look at the records of achievement of the Nigerian military in wars that have been prosecuted in the past internationally, you understand that it is not the kind of military that can run away from any war. But when there are no you know, facilities to prosecute this war, there's tendency for soldiers to become complacent, to become demoralized. So I, that is why I think beyond the charge by the president, the government on its own part you know, must also ensure that it in, in, improves on the capacity of our, of our soldiers, of our military men to ensure that you know, their morale is boosted, their welfare is taken care of, and their equipment are available to prosecute. Nobody, nobody will face Boko Haram insurgent out of patriotism alone without the required, you know, so because these are issues that lead to you know, some of this complacency in human beings. So we must look at that angle. And I know that the military authorities have been doing the best in the last couple of, and that is why even the chief of army staff himself have to relocate, you know, to Bronu to ensure that it takes charge at the, at the center of the war. I think these are ways of boosting the morale of the men on the, on the front line. So right. the government must also do its own part to ensure that you know, the needed facilities are provided, the welfare of these men is seriously taken care of, then we can expect results. Well, I believe that's a point that uh, the, those in authority will take uh, very, very seriously. Let's talk about the price of fuel. Now, this one affects every Nigerian, wherever you are. Uh, when it comes to the price of petrol at the filling stations, uh, it, it is something that a lot of people react to emotionally uh, sometimes. 125 naira per liter, that is the current price now. The PPPRA has said Nigerians uh, should expect to pay more or even lower. Uh, wh what do you have to say concerning the, this price? Uh, you know, what uh, the PPRA uh, has said. Uh, well, the PPRA have clearly said the prices of petrol will be determined by market forces, mm -hmm. just like we have experienced in other sectors. I think competition is one of the major, you know, ingredients of uh, 
you know, private sector driven uh, economies, uh, businesses like the petroleum sector, for the government having removed its hand totally by the assertion that we no longer pay subsidy. And we want to believe that this is true, that we, don't, we no longer pay subsidy so that we don't wake up tomorrow again and begin to hear stories of how much more have been used to subsidize PMS. I believe we may not necessarily expect higher prices, but depending on the international you know, price of crude oil, which eventually, if it comes up you know, from what is currently experiencing, but there are tendencies that if there are competitions and the market is liberalized enough, there are tendencies that we may have to pay lower prices because more people may come into this business and there'll be you know, more products distribution and everybody would want to sell. So yeah, but some uh, analysts are saying that we, Nigerians really should be paying a lot lower than the 125 uh, that we're paying now. And uh, well, hopefully uh, they much talked about privatization of the, uh, the refineries mm -hmm. uh, could bring that about. Uh, are you looking forward to a time sooner than later when Nigeria uh, really should be paying much lower, considering the fact that we're the world's sixth or largest uh, producer. Of, uh, you know, uh, sixth, seventh largest producer of uh, yeah. oil in the, in the world. Well, it is the expectation of the average Nigerian, but that may not be achievable until we have the local capacity to refine, you know, this crude oil for our own use. We cannot continue to import, you know, refined products and expect such. So I think this is the major factor that has been responsible for how much more we are paying for the pump price of petroleum products in Nigeria. So if we expect a future where prices will become lower, it has to be when refineries are fully functional locally, when more private sector you know, come in to build refineries, you know, to support what uh, we are experiencing from some private sector part, uh, uh, participants in the, in the oil business now. Until that is achieved, we may not be able to, or we may not expect lower prices than you know, we are currently paying because even despite the lower prices of crude oil, you must, we must agree or understand that this, the, the prices we pay uh, you know, are still being be determined by the exchange rate that is used, you know, in, you know, the foreign exchange that is used in trading, you know, in buying this product. So we may not expect lower prices until we are able to you know, ensure that we have adequate you know, local capacity to process this crude oil into you know, the products that we consume. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, Femi, there's also the issue, uh, as I switch gears once again, of uh, the Sunny Abacha loot and the United States wanting to repatriate that money back to Nigeria. Could you give us a bit more information on the conditions of that repatriation process? Well, the conditions, you know, just like uh, stated by the Attorney General when that uh, agreement was signed, are that this particular tranche of these loot recovered from the late uh, Sonia Bacha are going to be channeled towards you know, three, three critical infrastructure uh, projects in Nigeria. That is the Lagos Ibadan Express Road, the second Niger Bridge, then the Abuja Kano Express. That has been the content of the agreement. And why is the United States so much interested in how this you know, money is spent? It has to do with, you know, the, the, you know, the lack of transparency of how previous refund you know, of these loots were spent. In this country, we have, ex we have seen a situation where people claimed they went to the streets to distribute $300 million to poor people and no record of people who benefited. No, when you even ask for the names of beneficiaries, the government tells you, no, we can't publish your names. And today, you know, we are talking about a country you know, that claimed you know, to do all sorts of things in the name of the recovered loot, but today could not account for it. And no country will be interested in trust. It's a, it's a matter of trust. And I think it's an indictment of anti-corruption, you know, effort as a country that we are not, we cannot be trusted with $300 million because this, the government of the United States and Jersey does not want this reform, the return loot to be relooted. That is the implication. And that is why it is monitoring it, engaging the civil society, and keenly interested in how this money, you know, money will be utilized, because it is not enough to just release this money to the government.
All right, uh, public affairs analyst Femi Lawson, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show this morning. Always enlightening insights.